Hello and welcome. Let's start with a quote by Penn Gillette. Quote, the question I get asked by religious people all the time is, without God, what should stop me from raping all I want? And my answer is, I do rape all I want, and the amount I want is zero. And I do murder all I want, and the amount I want is zero. The fact that these people think that if they didn't have this person watching over them, that they would go on killing, raping, rampages is the most self-damning thing I can imagine. This quote is a perfect embodiment of today's topic, relativism, nihilism, and egoism. It is the kind of thing which you can hear everywhere and it sounds great, right up until you start paying attention, at which point it becomes utterly terrifying. In this lecture, we are looking at the issues of relativism, nihilism, and egoism, specifically through the lens of the development of these theories and the impacts of those developments over the past about 300 years. We want to look at the question of ethics from this perspective now, before we get into the intricacies of our other ethical theories, because relativism, nihilism, and egoism are the negation of ethics. This consideration should tell us why it's worth looking into those other theories and should give us a bit of guidance on what to keep an eye out for. Now, if you look back at our lectures on metaphysics, you'll notice that we can't help having some kind of an ethical theory because we inherently put value on and evaluate the world around us. Thus, we are stuck using some kind of an ethical theory. For those of you who have not seen that video, I highly suggest watching it and reading the article first. Both links are in the description. Note that one of the options for a metaphysical system was nihilism, relativism, and egoism. That option, however, is not what we actually mean by the more common idea of an ethical theory, and we'll cover why in a moment. So the argument made in our reading, and the one that we'll advance here today, is that nihilism, relativism, and egoism do function as a metaphysical system, but are not the kind of thing that should be taken as a system, at least in terms of what we mean by ethical theories, and not if we would like to stay coherent. So what exactly do we mean by relativism, nihilism, and egoism? These are three distinct concepts, but they ultimately reduce into the same outlook, so we will ultimately combine them. Relativism is the idea that says that right and wrong are relative to an agent, a person in question. So the way that we understand right and wrong is not about some objective external standard, but about our perspective. And there are two variations here. First, descriptive relativism simply says that the relativistic ideas of right and wrong are what we observe out there. It says nothing about whether there is actually an objective external right and wrong, only that when we observe people in groups, they all operate from the position that right and wrong are clear from their perspective. The issue is that when we ask someone with a different perspective, they have a different set of definitions for that right and wrong. And so it seems that there is no actual standard and all right and wrong depend on perspective. Notice that this is like saying that when we're looking at the same object, we have different perception because we're standing in different locations. However, there still is some sort of an object that we are observing. Prescriptive realism, on the other hand, says that the reason why these differences exist is because there is no objective right and wrong. There is no right or wrong way to understand the object of ethical claims because there is no object of ethical claims. There is ultimately no such thing as right or wrong. There is only meaning that we happen to impose on some event, and so we think of it as having moral value, but there is no actual moral value out there. If you'll recall the lecture on altruism, you'll note that descriptive relativism is fine, and we do see it in the choices of highest moral value. Prescriptive relativism is what we want to focus on here because it ties into the other two issues. So nihilism, from the Latin nihil, meaning nothing, is a position that there are no values. There is nothing that should or rationally can be valued because nothing has any value. Why not? Well, nihilism arises out of extreme skepticism. And so when, in extreme skepticism, the idea of truth got lost, truth as some sort of an absolute objective and knowable entity, it took the idea of values right with it. And this is because value claims are ultimately claims about truth. 
pure nihilists reject any interpretation of meaning in the world. Nothing has any meaning, nothing can be truly known, so nothing has any actual value. And therefore, you, me, and a pile of dog poop on the sidewalk have the same value, and that value is always zero. Now, a different group of nihilists took the nihilistic argument and came to something like the realization that you can't actually negate all value. And the reason why not is because you have to make choices, and all choices, as we've noted before, are value judgments. Camus, for example, notes that there is no objective reason why you should not have killed yourself this morning instead of getting out of bed, but you chose to live today, and so that means that you valued living over dying. And this is true for every decision you make where you have an option, and because you can always just kill yourself instead, you always have an option. Again, this is Camus' sort of extreme version of the idea. So now we have nihilists who also understand that we're inherently stuck with some value set. But there is no reason to believe in value set A over value set B. That is, values are relativistic. And what's more, the value set that makes the most sense to these kinds of nihilists is the value set that promotes your own preferences. Why is that? Because in a way, you can't help it. Remember that your highest moral value determines right and wrong. And then remember that whatever aims toward your highest moral value is good, and whatever aims away is bad. So that, in a way, all you ever do is what you want to do. That is, your actions are always aiming at the thing that you want, theoretically at least. And therefore, no matter what you say, you're always going to be looking out for number one. This is called egoism the theory that people act only with regard to their own preferences and never from some actual objective external standard. So finally, egoism. Egoism is what happens when you have prescriptive relativists follow their own logic into becoming nihilists, but remain aware enough that they catch the fact that you can't actually be without some kind of a value system. So what you get is egoism. The idea that it's all relative, nothing is good or bad by itself, there are no actual values, and so you should just do whatever you prefer to do since that's all you can do. Yes, that is a very simplified version, and yes, there's a lot more to it, but these are the core features. This line of thinking ultimately says the same thing as every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. That is, the highest moral value says that the only thing worthy of pursuit is one's own desire. At that point, the only criterion of judgment is our personal preferences. There is no external standard, and so no way in which things ought to be, except for our own personal, subjective, and individual preferences. The fact that my preferences and your preferences don't match is ultimately irrelevant. It is up to us individually to make the world fit our own preferences, and to do so without regard to anyone or anything else. At this point, I do want to take a little detour and consider this attitude in light of religious texts. Every religious text I'm aware of designates this kind of attitude as satanic or demonic and considers it to be the highest form of idolatry. So let's take a look at the big six religions. When we read the Bhagavad Gita, that is a book of Hinduism, the royal cousins that are trying for a military coup are trying to murder and dethrone the rightful prince. They are doing so not because of some ideological disagreement or this idea that they might have some sort of issue with his governance. Instead, they're doing it because they would prefer that they were the ones in charge. That is, they are waging war and destroying things because reality does not match their preference, and so they're willing to murder and destroy. And so, in turn, the story is about why such people must be destroyed if you're going to have a society. In Buddhism, the path of destruction is followed when we pursue our preferences, those would be pleasures and desires, instead of subordinating those preferences to reason and reality. So making reason and reality primary, and then when our desires and preferences contradict with reason and reality, we beat them back into submission. Taoism and Confucianism argue that it is the pursuit of personal desires, rather than proper relations to harmonize the self and society with the world, that lead to the destruction of self and society. Notice that in both of these systems, 
Understanding the nature of reality and the proper relation of humanity to that reality and to each other is the basis for not getting obliterated by the universe. In Abrahamic religions, Satan rebels against God because God's will did not match Satan's preferences. In the story of Cain and Abel, Cain rebels because the rules of God don't match his preferences. In a variety of prophetic stories, the people who are doing evil, that is, the people to whom some messenger is sent, are unwilling to reconsider their behavior because those evil actions are what they prefer to do. Finally, in the Quran, there is a number of times that this particular line is repeated that translates roughly into, have you seen the one who takes as his God his own desire? Now this sounds rather odd to us because we have a habit of thinking about idolatry, placing something else as a god, as worshipping idols of stone or some other such behavior. But the stress really seems to be on the idea of displacing God, however defined, from the position of the highest moral value. So the idea of placing your preferences over some kind of objective, external, transcendent reality is traditionally understood around the world, throughout all cultures, to be inhuman, that is, a demonic way of being. And such people are seen to be a danger to themselves, to society, and to everyone else. Now this matters for our lecture because it means that the traditional ethical theories acknowledge the idea of nihilistic relativistic egoism. However, they also rejected that position as the worst possible option because it rejects the very idea that the world has meaning, that human beings have a purpose, and that there is a way in which things ought to be and ought not to be. With only your desires as the highest moral value, you make yourself into God and your desires become the only standard by which you evaluate the world. We will return to these ideas in later lectures, but for now it's important to note that egoism stands in complete opposition to the traditional concept of ethics. On to our reading. Michael Polanyi is one of those people whose range of expertise is absolutely mind-boggling, from economics to history to philosophy to politics and so on. And so when we look at his chapter one of his book, Meaning, it should not be a surprise that he manages to compress a complex and layered argument along with some 300 years of history as proof in the roughly 20 pages. He writes in a super dense way and so he requires quite a bit of unpacking. Now because I've actually covered this explanation in a different video, I'll just leave the link to that video and the timestamp both as a link on screen here and in the description below. Once you've watched that, you can come back and we'll pick it up from there. So the general thing to note is that Polanyi is trying to establish that reason, morality, and intellectual freedom must be understood as immutable universal values. And he thinks this is crucial because without them, we will descend into the madness that was the first half of the 20th century, genocides and all. Now, he summarizes the idea like this. The downfall of liberty is when it becomes pointless and disappears. And that happens anywhere that reason and morality are deprived of status as a force in their own right. If morality depends on something else, if intellectual liberty is only there to serve another purpose, then we can get rid of both of them. And we will do that just as soon as we feel that it is to our advantage to do so. And then there is nothing that we can use as a standard and everything goes to hell once again. Except this time, we have the scientific advancement that will make the world wars look like a joke. To quote Einstein, I do not know with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So this is where relativism, nihilism, and egoism ultimately end up, on the path of absolute destruction of humanity, at least according to Polanyi. So let's take a look at two very powerful quotes on this topic. Dostoevsky, in his Brothers Karamazov, says, quote, If there is no God, everything is permitted. And what he means by that is that if there is no objective external reference for values, then any set of values is just as good as any other one. In that case, the permissibility of actions only depends on who has the power to actualize their preferences and to bring them to life. So that is, if there is no God, then all we can ever have is that might makes right, and might is used to actualize your preferences, 
Thus, everything is permitted so long as you can physically pull it off. In his Madman, Nietzsche presents one of the coolest, highly compressed arguments. Speaking uh, about God, he says, We have killed him, you and I. We are his murderers. But how have we done this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? Are we not perpetually falling? Backward, sideways, forward, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? What he means here, in part, is the idea that the horizon stands as a point of reference for up and down, and in this analogy it stands for good and evil. By killing God, by which Nietzsche means that the people and society have displaced the idea of God in their hearts with their own personal preferences, people have actually removed that criterion of right and wrong. The horizon is a way that we orient ourselves, but if we have killed God, what we actually did is we got rid of that horizon, so that right and wrong are no longer meaningful ideas. At that point, the very idea of right and wrong has become nonsensical. On the notion of unchaining ourselves from the sun, what Nietzsche means here is something like this, uh, and this is in reference to illuminationist theories, which say something like uh, the, the way that we symbolically represent knowledge and goodness is in terms of light, and the sun being at the center of the universe then sort of meant that we're circling about the entity which gives off light, truth, and goodness. So if now we have unchained ourselves from the sun, what is happening is that we are no longer tied to the idea of truth and goodness. And so it is now moving. We are in motion. And that means that we're actually moving away from the concept of truth and value. And he asks the question, whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? And that is a question as to how exactly are we going to find another source of truth and goodness now that we have cut ourselves off from what has been the traditional understanding of, of humanity across history. And so he asks that uh, second question, uh, are we not perpetually falling backwards, sideways, forward in all directions? Is there any up or down left? All this brings us to the exploration of the meanings of relativism, nihilism, and egoism. If we buy into the premises that they offer, we necessarily must conclude that there is no such thing as actual ethics. There is no right or wrong, no good or evil, and no values that are anything more than preferences. And when I say preferences, I mean something like your favorite color or your favorite ice cream flavor. At this point, a lot of people like to say things like, we don't need ethics, we know how to behave. And they'll follow it up with an idea like, I don't need some book telling me what to believe and how to act. Now we can return to our original quote, which summarizes this issue quite well. The question I get asked by religious people all the time is, without God, what to stop me from raping all I want? And my answer is, I do rape all I want, and the amount I want is zero. And I do murder all I want, and the amount I want is zero. The fact that these people think that if they didn't have this person watching over them, that they would go on killing, raping rampages is the most self-damning thing that I can imagine. And this is a line by Penn Jillette. So let's focus a bit on that answer itself. Let's take that uh, combination of lines. I do rape all I want, and I do murder all I want. And let's switch it up for a little bit. So take that line, I do rape all I want. And instead of it being Penn Jillette, let's imagine that this line is said by Bill Cosby, or Harvey Weinstein, or Jeffrey Epstein, or Joseph James D'Angelo. Uh, there's a link to him in the link below. Maybe it was said by Hutus in Rwanda who had an estimated half a million rapes. Maybe it was said by Serbs and Croats in Bosnia, by Pakistanis in Bangladesh with an estimated two to four hundred thousand rapes. Maybe by the Japanese with the rape of Nanking and so on. For the phrase, I do murder all I want, let's imagine that the line is said by Hitler, or Stalin, or Mao, or Pol Pot, or Al-Qaeda, or ISIS, or the KKK, or the Lord's Army, and so on. See how that same quote suddenly becomes terrifying? 
If we reduce morality to preference, then the reason why we should not rape, murder, and so on is because we don't feel like doing those things. And so as long as the amount of rape and murder that you want is zero, it's all good. But what happens when the amount of rape and murder you want becomes greater than zero? Now, don't try to get out of that by saying something like, I would never do such a thing. History offers us literally billions of counterexamples to that attitude. If you had asked a person in 1920s Germany how much rape and murder they wanted to do, they would have said zero. But then those same people became the Nazis, or the Gestapo, or later the Stasis in East Germany, or every lynch mob you've ever heard of. The question is not why you would feel the desire to do such things, because historically there are infinite reasons to rape, murder, and so on. And because we're talking about desire, desire is not subject to reason anyway. The real question is, why should you refrain from doing so when you do end up feeling like it? And here, we need a system of keeping us from doing terrible things, but not one that's based on somehow never having dark and terrible desires. Now, at this point, people like to argue that these are extreme cases, they're out of the ordinary, but there are several problems with this pitch. The first one is that if your ethical position does not work at the extremes, your ethical position does not work, period. Of course people are nice when everything is going their way. If a rapist was super charismatic and everyone wanted to sleep with him, there would be no desire to rape per se. If the other people would only do exactly what you wanted them to do, there would never be any need for violence. Well, duh. That's no different than saying that if everyone did everything you wanted, when you wanted, in the way that you wanted, there would be no need for conflict. That is not a functional solution to this problem because fact of the matter is, not everybody is in agreement about everything. Second, there is such an overwhelming preponderance of these extreme cases that they are more like run-of-the-mill everyday cases. These are not unique events, they happen every single day, so you better have a theory that can actually address that. And finally, and most crucially, claiming the relativistic, nihilistic, and egoistic position means that you have to agree that, objectively speaking, Hitler, Mao, and Stalin did nothing wrong. Their only mistake was their ultimate failure. If only they had succeeded, it would have been alright. Now, do we really want to say that genocide, rape, world wars, gassing of civilians, and so on is alright as long as you can get away with it? Is this position really that broken? The problem in the logic here starts with the idea that ethical theories must rest on some kind of an unassailable ground of objective demonstrable, materially quantifiable proofs. The fact that we can't seem to find that or agree on it is then what makes it seem like there is no objective external standard on which to base ethics, and so the relativist, nihilist, and egoist would seem to be right. However, as we noted, nothing at all stands on such grounds. Everything, and I do mean everything, ultimately stands on assumed axiomatic ideas about the universe. And yes, that includes physics, and yes, that includes mathematics. And you can't prove axioms, so now you're stuck. If there are no objective ethics, then there is no way to pass judgment on anyone or anything other than saying that you don't like it. Yes, in the same way that I don't like okra, or some people don't like strawberries. And so, we're forced to conclude that, on this reading of ethics, good is just whatever you want and can get away with. And whenever you fail to get away with something, that thing is now bad. And this is a truly terrifying idea, not least because we just affirmed that all ideas are equally good, and so the only difference between, say, a rapist and a rape victim is whether they're strong enough to actualize their preference, the former to rape and the latter to avoid being raped. That is ultimately the might makes right position, and it has never, ever led to anything positive historically. So this is why the idea that, quote, everyone should decide for themselves what's good and bad, the kind of thing that you often hear on college campuses, is a terrible idea. In fact, not a one of you actually believes this. It's just the kind of thing that we say when we don't want to do the heavy lifting of actually figuring out right and wrong, and it happens not to affect us so we can afford not to care. 
Now, if I could get away with passing those of you I like and failing those of you I don't, all the people failing the class would suddenly change their minds on whether or not there is an objective standard of right and wrong that would then be applied to my behavior. And therefore, you better hope that the examination of other ethical ideas yields something better because otherwise, I get to fail you. Uh, that's a little bit of relativism humor there. So, that concludes our lesson. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to leave it in the comments or email me directly. Thank you.